Hello, good morning. Welcome to Clinky Evangelical Church, Sunday morning service this week. Should we begin with a word of prayer? Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you once more that we can come into your presence. We thank you in a world of change, in a world where everything else has changed so much in the last 12 months, right across our world, politically and in many other ways. We realise and we see the vulnerability of human life. We see human life slipping away. We see people struggling mentally, socially, physically, financially. We thank you, your word tells us you are the same yesterday, today and forever. You're the eternal, almighty, unchanging God. And your love is as great as you. Your love is eternal, unchanging, unconditional. A love so great that from the dawn of history you have loved us. Planned our salvation and the fullness of time gave your son. We thank you, Lord God, that in Jesus Christ and in him alone, there is a way of salvation and forgiveness that is open to us because he has paid in our price for our sins. So, Lord, this morning, accept our praise and worship for Jesus' sake. For your Holy Spirit, Lord, speak to our hearts and our lives. Forgive and remove all you see is wrong and draw us closer and nearer to yourself. For Jesus' sake alone. Amen. Oh, this morning, we're going to carry on looking at statements our Bible make about God. We saw one last week. Before we do, I want to just think about something else for a few minutes this morning. There's a verse in the Bible that says this, be sure your sins will find you out. Now, we don't like things we've done wrong coming back to haunt us. Politicians often talk about skeletons in our cupboard, don't they? And the media love to dig up things from people's past. They can bring back to shame them and humiliate them and embarrass them. And we realise this is something that happens in our world today. But none of us like to be reminded of mistakes we've made in the past. None of us like our wrong to be exposed. But the Bible says in Numbers 32 verse 23, be sure your sins will find you out. Now, last time, last week, I talked about a shoebox. The fact that that box is full of light, but when we shut the lid, it's full of darkness. And we said how very often we would like to, we'd love to be able to put all our mistakes and failings in a box and shut the lid so no one can see it. Then if no one can see them, we can pretend and we can kid ourselves that they don't matter and they're not important. Well, I want to carry on thinking about that for a few minutes this morning. I want to tell you a story in the Bible, a story that has a lot to teach us about sin sin in your life and mine, the mistakes that we make, the things we do wrong. You see, in a story, it's a story about a snake. So if you imagine my nice wooden snake here as a real snake, okay, in Africa. And this snake has an obsession with eating eggs, and loves eating eggs. Now snakes aren't like you and me, they crunch and chew things up with their teeth. They have teeth that are used for biting and gripping, but their teeth will slope in. So whatever they eat, they swallow it whole. And it sounds gruesome, but they can dislocate their jaws and open their jaws wide. They can swallow something that's bigger than what they are. And there's a massive bulge in their stomach. So if you imagine those snakes just eating an egg, there'll be a massive egg-sized bulge somewhere in his body, about here perhaps, like that. And this snake used to sneak into the huts in one of the African villages and eat the eggs that the chickens laid. And he'd squeeze for a little tiny hole, eat the egg and go back out. And as he squeezed back for the hole, he'd squeeze real hard and the egg would break inside him. And he could squeeze through the hole and disappear. You see, if the egg didn't break, he couldn't get back through the hole, he'd be stuck. Snake scales all point back. So snakes can go forward, they can twist all kinds of angles, but they cannot go in reverse. So when he went through the little tiny hole in the hut wall, the eggshell had to break for the snake to get out. But he did it every day. Every day he'd look left, look right. He'd go along, he'd eat the egg, swallow it whole, go back through the little hole, crack the egg against the side of the hole, the egg would slop around inside him and he'd go home a happy snake fall asleep and say it doesn't matter. No one knows. The fact I'm stealing doesn't matter because I can get away with it. No one knows what I'm doing. But the man that lived in that hut, that kept hearing his chickens cluck but never ever saw any eggs, saw the marks on the floor, the giveaway signs in the dust, S-shaped signs where the snake had been slowed along. And he hard boiled an egg and he replaced the egg underneath the chicken with a hard boiled egg and he waited. Sure enough, Snake hears the chicken clucking, comes through the hole, swallows the egg. 
goes to go back for the little tiny hole, gets as far as the egg, but the egg won't break because this one's hard boiled, it's too hard, it won't break. And the snake is stuck, he can't go forward, he can't go back. The egg won't break, he's helpless. And all the hunter, or the man that lives in the house has to do is come along with a big stick and kill the snake. See, that snake thought he could get away with it because no one knew and no one saw. But the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. And you know, we cannot hide, we cannot hide the wrong things we've done and think that solves the problem. It makes them go away. It doesn't work like that. We can't hide our sins in the dark. We may be able to hide from others, but never from God. One day our lives will end. One day every one of us will stand before God who sees everything. Last week we had a text was this. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God sees everything, is exposed in the light of God's holiness and greatness. And we will be judged for our sins and our lives. It's no good trying to hide our sins from God. That is an impossible option. It just does not happen. It will not work. There's no way that can work. We need those sins to be forgiven and taken away. And we can't do that. I can't undo mistakes I've made in the past as much as I'd like to. I can't put right mistakes I've made. I can't undo some of the things I've said and done. Our sin is like an enemy that we can't defeat. But that is the only way to heaven. We remind ourselves of this as well last week, that heaven is not for good people. Heaven's for the perfect. And no matter how good we are, we're not perfect. There's only way you and I can go there is if our sins are removed and we are perfect, but we're never going to be perfect on our own. So when you look at it as a hopeless situation, we're facing an enemy, our sin, an enemy we cannot defeat, an enemy we can't undo, a problem we can't remove, a stain we can't get rid of on our lives. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It says that we deserve to pay the price for what we've done wrong. That's justice, isn't it? If you've made a mistake and broke the law, you deserve to pay the price for what you've done. So do I. But that verse in the Bible goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So the Bible is telling us that you and I, although we have sinned and we deserve to pay the price for our sin, that God has supplied a gift that can take away our sin. Remove it completely so it's no longer an issue that you and I can be right with God, can be seen in God's sight as perfect and fit for heaven. So what is this amazing gift? It's not what, it's who. It's Jesus, it's his own son. God so loved this world that he gave his only son. That is his gift. That whoever believes in Jesus should not perish, but have everlasting life. How can we have everlasting life? Only if our sin is paid for in full. That is what Jesus came to do. He's the only one good enough to pay the price of sin. He was the only one that was perfect. And so he gave his life. He defeated our sin. He won the victory over an enemy we could never defeat. He paid the price in full for your sin and mine so that we can be forgiven. We can be saved. We can be God's children. We can be reconciled through trust in him. And he says to you and me in the Bible, that I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to God the Father except through me. There's an old hymn that says these words, there was no one else good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in and praise God. That is what our Saviour has done. He's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. A door is open and we may go in. It's not about you and I hiding. It's not about you and I thinking we can get away with it because no one sees. It's about you and I realising that we're sinners. We have failed. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet God has provided in Jesus a Saviour who has paid the price in full for your forgiveness and salvation in mine. That trust in him, we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So are we trying to hide our sin? Are we trying to pretend it's not there? Are we going to kid ourselves it's all all right? Or are we trust in the one and only way of salvation that God's offered in Christ Jesus? Now, in the light of that, I now want to move on to think about what we're going to look at this week. And to start, I need to remind us what we started with last week. Verse in 1 John 1, verse 4. Five, and it says these words, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we saw God's perfect holiness last week and justice. The fact that God, there is no darkness at all in God. He's the exact opposite to you and me. The darkness of sin in our lives, God is perfect. The 
opposite to what we are. And before a holy, just God, our failings and our sins are exposed completely and absolutely, every single one of them. Sinful man's natural reaction, like we said earlier on, is to want to hide. We'd like to put all our problems, shut them up so no one knows, so no one, we can't be embarrassed or humiliated or made to look or feel so bad because of them. Adam and Eve did this in the Garden of Eden. When they sinned, they tried to hide from the holiness of God, didn't they? But you can't hide from God. The Bible tells us that wherever we go in this world, God is there. From the, before the dawn of history, he knew everything you and I were ever going to do. But such is our human nature, we do try to hide. You see, in John chapter 3, we read these words in verse 19. This is condemnation, that light, that's Jesus, has come into the world. And that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. He doesn't come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. We try to hide from the holiness of God. We try to hide our sin. We try to kid ourselves like the snake did. It doesn't matter because no one knows and no one sees. And so in 1 John 1 last week, we saw John in verse 4 turn to us and tell us that he has so important to share with us that will give us fullness of joy. The most amazing fullness of joy. And then he tells us that God is light and there is no darkness at all. And on the surface, that doesn't look like it's giving you much joy, does it? Because it just exposes our sin and condemns us. And shows the vast gulf between a holy just God and sinners like you and me. And it just reminds us, doesn't it? We said last week of this fairy tale idea that we've grown up with in all these stories and these films where the good people do good things and in the end they will live happily ever after. And the bad people do bad things and in the end they get what they deserve. It's like scales with good and bad. The more good you do, the more scales get tipped your way. And the more bad do, the more scales get tipped that way. And that's how people see life, isn't it? Happily ever after ending. No. There's no happily ever after ending for our efforts to be good. Heaven is God's home. We said just now, he sets the standard and it's perfection. You don't go to heaven because you're good and you've done good things. You go to heaven because you're perfect. And you and I are only perfect in Christ Jesus. There is no hiding. There's no kidding ourselves. There's no excuses. It says in 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. John's message continues in 1 John chapter 1, but he says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In fact, John puts it so beautifully in verse 7 of that chapter when he says, If we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. There is a way. Our sins can be totally covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. A perfect sacrifice for sin, who suffered in our place, who entered our world, who faced our darkness, who made the statement that is this morning's text, this morning's statement. And it's found in John chapter 8 and verse 12. John 8 verse 12, Jesus said to them again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that's our text this morning, I am the light of the world. But as we look at this, we need to read the rest of John chapter 8 to get the context, well, the first 12 verses anyway. So in John chapter 8, verse 1. Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple and the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them and the scribes and the Pharisees brought to a woman who had been caught committing adultery. And when they set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that he might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger in the dust, as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And some of those and those that heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus raised himself up, and saw no one but the woman. And he said to the woman, Where are the accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and sin no more. And Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. 
He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Again, like last week, this is a statement. Last week we saw God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Definite statements. You've got it again here. Jesus said, I am. Not could be, should be, might be, ought to be. I am the light of the world. And in the background of this story, as you look at it here, you've got these Jewish leaders and the crowds. In fact, everyone in the story seems a bit unsure of who Jesus is. In the chapter seven before this, we read that they were trying to work out and analyze who Jesus was. The crowds weren't sure. Even Jesus' disciples weren't totally sure why Jesus had really come and what he was doing. And the Jewish leaders definitely were trying to work out what they could do with Jesus. They'd seen, heard his claims, that he is the son of God, that he's the Messiah. They'd seen the miracles. They had to admit the miracles were real. The evidence was there. Many were inspired. Some were confused. But if you listen to John chapter 7, verse 40. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard these sayings, said, truly, this is a prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will Christ come out of Galilee? Has not scripture said that Christ comes and seated David in the town of Bethlehem, where David was? And there was a division amongst the people because of him. Some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. And so this whole situation where people are not quite sure who Jesus is. As far as the Jewish leaders are concerned, they saw Jesus as a threat. They didn't like the fact what he was teaching. They didn't like the fact that it was making people stop and think. That what he was saying was actually undermining some of the hypocrisy of what they were telling people. They didn't like the fact that they were being exposed with everyone else's sinners. They thought they were above and beyond this. They thought they were exempt. They put themselves on a pedestal. No one likes, what we said earlier on, being told or wrong, do they? And his Jewish leaders resented it. They lived with this aura that everyone looked up to them as these amazing, super holy people. And they wanted to hide their sin. They didn't want to expose. They didn't want to come to the light. They'd rather stay in the darkness. They'd rather trust their own efforts, not face their sin. So they planned to get rid of Jesus. But their plans fail. Listen again. John chapter 7, verse 45. The officers that they had sent to arrest Jesus came. And the high priest and the Pharisees said to them, Why have you not arrested Jesus? And the officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. And the Pharisees answered him, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd don't know what the law is. Occur they're accursed. Nicodemus, the one that came to Jesus by night, being one of the Pharisees, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And they answered and they said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look. No prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. They plan to get rid of him, but their plans fail. The guards they sent to arrest Jesus are so inspired by listening to Jesus' teaching, they come back empty-handed. The Jewish leaders can't agree on a course of action. They love to get rid of him. But legally, they know he's done nothing wrong. And he deserves a trial, and when he's put on trial, they know he's going to walk free. So they give up in despair, and they go home. But they're not finished. Such as their hate of Jesus, they're back the next morning, early, with a new plan and a new scheme. Which is where we come to today's story, in chapter 8. Early next morning they're back, and they've been busy. They've caught a woman sinning, committing adultery, it says about in the very act. How they were watching this woman and finding out she was committing adultery, whether it was trumped up charges, we don't know. Whatever it was, this woman is dragged in front of Jesus, pushed through the crowd, thrown to the ground in front of Jesus by these Pharisees and Jewish leaders. And they stand there and they present Jesus with this loaded question, planning to trap him, to discredit him, possibly to find someone to accuse him of. Can you imagine the picture? There's this woman. Imagine the shame, the humiliation, the fear, no hope, no way out, nowhere to hide. She has broken the law. The Levitical law stood at those days, in those days, she had broken that law. Her life is in ruins, her reputation's gone. And they are standing around her with faces full of anger and hate of the Jewish leaders. And they were right to one degree. If you followed through the letter of the Levitical law that the Israelites lived by, 
justice demanded death by stoning. Her life's in ruins, this woman. Her only hope is what Jesus' response is to these loaded questions that the Pharisees have asked him. She's in a hopeless situation on her own. She can't hide her sin. It's been exposed here, hung out on a washing line for everyone in the whole crowd to hear and see. As far as the Jewish leaders are concerned, this woman, it just ends to a means. They don't care about her. They don't care about her life. They don't care about ruining her life. They don't care about ruining her reputation. She's expendable. All they want is the summit to catch out or discredit Jesus. And they see this as an amazing two-way trap. If Jesus says, yes, you're right, stoner, they can immediately come back and accuse Jesus of being a hypocrite. He teaches love and forgiveness. And here he is saying, kill her. Where's your forgiveness? Where's your love? And then if Jesus, on the other hand, says, no, let her go. Then they can accuse Jesus of not keeping the law. So it's one of those really hard situations where it's very hard, six one, half a dozen the other, to know what the right thing to say is. And we've all got the situations that we've been in them sometimes, haven't we? Situations where whatever we say, we know we're going to upset someone or we're going to put our foot in it one way or the other. Whatever we say, someone's going to fire something bad at us. And it's one of those situations. So what does Jesus do? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus fulfilled his father's law completely. He was perfect. He had to be to be our saviour. He never, yet he never condoned sin. He never belittled sin. He never pushed sin under the carpet. He saw sin for what it was. Yet Jesus could never be accused of being a hypocrite and not loving and not living out the love and forgiveness that he preached. So my boy has a title of this section. It calls this section an adulteress facing the light of the world. A sinner. And no matter what the sin is, that's you and me. Every single one of us are sinners. We can easily point the finger at the Jewish leaders, other people and say, oh, they've done this, they've done that. They're bad people. Doesn't matter who, what that sin is. We've all sinned. We've all failed. We are not perfect. There is no grades of sin in God's sight. Sin is sin no matter what it is. And your lie and my lying is as bad as being a murderer or a terrorist or a rapist in God's sight. Our selfishness and pride and arrogance and our rejection of God are every bit as bad as the big bad sins that society says are so bad. We sinned. It's as simple as that. It's either perfection or a sinner. And we're not perfect, we're the sinner. So the Pharisees standing there judging her. They were really in a position to do that. And you know, the only person that's fit to judge is someone that's perfect. And that's why God's judgment is always perfect. And here Jesus, the light of the world, turns that light, that spotlight, of God's holiness and justice. Not on the people, not on the woman to start with, it's been accused, but on everyone. And that crowd, the Jewish leaders, the disciples, the crowd, the woman, everyone at the same time. He turns and he simply says, he who's about sin, you cast the first stone. You know, we're very good accusing other people. We're very good at pointing out of your faults and sins, aren't we? Not so good at facing our own. Especially with this COVID situation moment, how quick are we to judge other people we think they're breaking the rules? Or we think there's too many of them getting together and are not correct distance apart. We're all doing it, aren't we? Hmm, where's that big, they're not the same family, or they're not still two meters apart, where's our mask? And we're very quick to accuse other people, aren't we? It's in our human nature. But Jesus here says, if you're perfect, then you've got a right to accuse someone else. And that's where everyone has to start. We just stop hiding, stop pointing out other sins and failings, stop making excuses for our own. We need to realise our sin is exposed before God. Because God is light and there's no darkness at all. And we're helpless sinners with no excuse and no hope. And you know, there are two responses to this challenge that Jesus made here to this woman. First one is what the Jewish leaders did. One by one, convicted by their conscience, they turned around and walked away embarrassed. No one threw a stone. 
They walked away. They walked away from the light. Just like you and me, wishing we could shut the bad things up in a box where no one can see them. So we pretend they're not there. Right, they knew the sin was there, but they'd rather cover it up and walk away than come to the light. They chose darkness rather than light, didn't they? Like it said in John chapter 3, men choose darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light unless their deeds are exposed. But to walk away and to hide that sin means that sin still remains, separating us from God. None of those Jewish leaders that turned and walked away knew what it was to be forgiven, knew what it was to be right with God, because they walked away in their sin, didn't they? Is that your response this morning? To Jesus, the light of the world? The light that exposes yours and mine, failings, shortcomings and mistakes. Exposes us what we really are. Is that our response? To hide it? To walk away? To dismiss it? To shut the Bible? To turn this recording off because you don't like what you're hearing? If we say we have no sin, the Bible says, we deceive ourselves and we make God a liar. Or your response in mind could be the same as that woman. Everyone else is gone and Jesus turns to her and he says, where's your accuser? She says, they're gone. She knew her sin and shame. She didn't run and try to hide because she knew there was nowhere to hide. She had no hope except Jesus. And as she remains a helpless sinner there before the light of the world, she found forgiveness. Yes, yeah, she had sinned, but so have I and so have you and so have those Jewish leaders and Pharisees. They walked away. She trusted Jesus and found in him forgiveness. He turns to her, he forgives her sins. And he calls her to obey him, to love him, to turn from her sin and walk with him. And a new relationship, a relationship that's real, a relationship that's special because he loves her, because he came to be her saviour and her Lord. But how can sin be forgiven? Can God just let her off? Surely that's not fair. Surely if someone's done something wrong, they should pay for it. That's not justice. Who's paying the price for a sin? God never lets people off their sin. God never just pushes sin under the carpet. God never dismisses it and says it doesn't matter anymore. No. God is just. What happens is that someone else pays the price in your place, in mine. Someone else paid the place, sin, in the place of that woman. And countless millions throughout history they have come to God for forgiveness and salvation. Who pays the price instead of us? Jesus, the light of the world, the one that entered our world. The world didn't understand when he came. It didn't comprehend who he was and why he'd come. The Jewish leaders didn't get it here. They just saw him as a threat. The Romans just saw him as a political powder keg that could cause so many problems. The disciples still saw him as a great leader and a messiah that was going to save them from the Romans and set them free. They all didn't get the fact and grasp it fully till later why Jesus came and what he came to do. Because on that cross, the perfect son of God, the light of the world, bore our darkness and our sin and our shame. And he gave his life as God places on him our guilt and shame and sin instead of us. And he dies the death that was mine and the death that was yours. The Romans thought they got rid of Jesus. The Jews thought they got rid of him by lies and trumped up charges. The crowd stood there and so perhaps the disciples saw an innocent person, falsely accused, dying on a cross. Ignominy, shame. It's all over. Humiliation, defeat. The Bible says in John's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus himself says, no one takes my life from me. This is why I've came. I will lay my life down. I will pay him full for sin. I will shout in triumph on that cross. It's finished. And I will take my life again and rise victorious. Victorious over the enemy that you and I can't defeat. Victorious over our sin. There is justice for sin. Justice is totally satisfied because Jesus paid it all. He is the one that gives us justice. He is the one that fulfilled the law completely. He is the one that pays the price in our place. So God's justice is satisfied to look on him 
and pardon me and pardon you. This was that woman's only hope and this is your hope and my hope, our only hope. Jesus, the light of the world, who gives forgiveness and salvation through his death and resurrection for you and me. Jesus, the light of the world, it shows the truth about God's holiness about our sin. Jesus, the light of the world, it shows us the way, the only way of salvation. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, that brings life, everlasting life and forgiveness through what he has done. Will we walk away? Or will we cast ourselves as that woman did? Will we cast ourselves as sinners today, totally on his love and mercy and trust his forgiveness and salvation? Will we come to the light of the world and live? Do we pray? Dear Lord God, we're very good at judging other people and pointing out their failings and mistakes. And Lord, this story teaches us to look at our own lives, examine our lives, to see our failings and mistakes. And yet see the glorious truth that we're still loved by you. And in Christ Jesus, the light of the world, we can be forgiven and saved and reconciled to you. Lord, help us to not walk away from the light, but help us to come to the light. Come to the light and trust that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin, will reconcile us with you, that we will walk in the light as you are in the light, for his precious sake alone. Amen.